Thank you very much, Mirwan. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there is, a, in fact, uh, I uh, hesitated uh, regarding the question mark because uh, uh, at the beginning uh, I was not sure at all. I, I'm, I mean, there, there are many aspects of uh, toposis probably that could be right now very interesting for what we are doing. But uh, then there are some other aspects for now I have no idea of what they could bring to our activity at Huawei and essentially in um, uh, wireless networks, okay? So, in fact, this, uh, this talk is essentially a way uh, of trying to identify uh, the, uh, the topics covered by this uh, these wireless networks, the topics in which toposes can bring uh, some uh, uh, can bring uh, uh, some value, and uh, in fact, uh, at the beginning I had very few of them, and then uh, by thinking, by looking at the literature, uh, many uh, other ones came to my mind, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, that it's uh, just the beginning and probably in the near future we will be able to identify even some uh, other topics very interesting and uh, that uh, could uh, uh, bring some solutions to some of our problems. Okay, so let's start with uh, the problematics that we have in wireless networks and get that could be impacted by topics. Okay, so uh, first, uh, what is wireless network? What is the, uh, the wireless communication in general? In fact, uh, it is uh, something that uh, uses a lot of uh, tools that are very uh, diverse. Uh, for example, information theory, so uh, uh, Shannon theory essentially. Signal processing because uh, uh, in these wireless communication networks, in fact, we have to transmit uh, bits, and uh, the problem is that to transmit bits, these bits have to be converted into signals, and then, of course, at the receiver, these uh, signals have to be processed uh, in a way that uh, we, we can, for example, minimize the error probability or some other measure. We have also optimization. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, there, are, there are many points where optimization can be uh, useful. And uh, I can give you an example. Uh, suppose that you have uh, many, in fact, uh, uh, in wireless networks, in fact, wireless ne uh, the wireless network is a cellular network. And uh, the problem is that each cell interferes uh, with the neighboring cells, right? And uh, the problem, of course, is that if uh, uh, everybody starts uh, to talk um, loudly. Uh, the problem is that uh, you will impact the signal to noise ratio of the neighbor that will start to speak even louder, etc., etc. And so, of course, it will diverge. And that's why uh, there are some uh, procedure which I'll call the uh, power control in order to avoid uh, these uh, problems and uh, uh, the the. Um, and we have to find uh, the optimal solution of power control. So it's an optimization problem that can be centralized or uh, decentralized. I mean, we have also problem uh, related to data fusion. Uh, for example, if we have sensors, we want to use them in order to localize uh, terminals or in order to do something else. And so, uh, uh, and then we have graphs. So graphs uh, can be used to study the cellular network. It can be used also for channel coding. I will give you some example afterwards. And finally, uh, there maybe I forgot some of them. So sorry for that. And uh, finally, at least in my list, there is uh, channel modeling, which is very important uh, because uh, uh, this is the basis of the wireless network. And uh, in order, for example, to be able uh, to transmit or to uh, receive efficiently uh, the, 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 the signals that have been transmitted. In fact, we need to know 
the behavior of the channel, and we need to model the channel in some sense. Okay, so you see there are quite a lot of uh, technical areas impacted by wireless. So now, okay, if I just copy the definition of the Grothendieck topos, uh, what can be the relation between this and this? This is not obvious at all, and this was uh, the, the, the problem that uh, uh, I was faced with that problem. So uh, what, which uh, of these uh, items can be impacted by, uh, by, by this? In fact, uh, it's not easy at all to answer directly. But just using the definition, we can first try to find some relations between some of these topics, maybe all of them, you will see. Uh, the first one, for example, <laughs> Daniel has, uh, has shown in his uh, talk uh, the, the relation that uh, we can find between information theory and the topos. For the other ones, there can be some, some um, sorry, relations. And in fact, I will start by uh, uh, finding some relations between these points and sheaves, okay? And uh, moreover, there is another constraint we have. The problem is that uh, we need uh, uh, to implement algorithms, we need uh, to perform computations, all right? And so uh, we need uh, to use uh, computational and uh, algorithmic mathematics. And that means that, uh, for example, the sites or, um, uh, or the topological spaces that uh, we will have uh, that, that, that we can use will be quite restricted. They cannot be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we need to find uh, the ones onto which we can compute some interesting quantities like uh, cohomology, etc. And uh, also we need to find, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some, uh, uh, we need to find also uh, sheaves that give rise to computations that make sense for us. For example, what we can do the best is linear algebra in terms of computation. And uh, that's why uh, we will mainly focus on these restrictions. Okay. So, first of all, I needed to analyze why we need, uh, we could need the sheaves or, or more, more deeply uh, toposes. In fact, this property of sheaves uh, is uh, the one which we need the more. That means the how to reconstruct, I mean, from local to global, we have local data, how to reconstruct the global picture. And uh, in fact, that's why the computations that we will mainly be faced to will be the computation of cohomology groups, et cetera, et cetera. And also sometimes uh, to derive some criteria for setting to zero some cohomology groups in order to remove the obstructions, okay? And uh, so, okay, the, for example, our local data can be local probabilities. Uh, they can be uh, LLR, so this is log likelihood ratio, so it is related to probabilities. For example, uh, for coding, for channel coding. They can be local interferences if we uh, consider a cellular network and we want to go from the local uh, interferences picture to something more global. And so uh, in this case, uh, we, we, we need uh, from there to derive the right sheaves. Uh, and so for the last uh, stage, uh, I have to confess that I haven't too much idea for now. Okay, let's start with uh, one uh, of these uh, applications, which is in fact the channel. It is the basis. The channel is the basis for us. Okay, so first uh, topic is, uh, I would call it learning the channel. I can tell you why. Suppose that we have, a, for example, this is a, a cellular network with a, here a cell with its base station. So you see uh, the antennas. 
and uh, 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 mobile terminal that communicated with this uh, base station. I consider in this example the uplink. And so we have, uh, let's say that in general, if we use a, a simple model, we can say that what we receive in, uh, on all antennas, so this is why uh, there is uh, this word, MIMO, which means multiple input, multiple output, so multiple antennas at the transmitter, multiple antennas at the receiver. So, in fact, uh, it is uh, this model which is the simplest and the most commonly used. So, what we receive at all the antennas is modeled as a vector, y, and it is uh, some matrix h times what is transmitted by the terminal, uh, which is also a vector, uh, and plus some noise, z. This noise component, in fact, uh, can incorporate also interferences coming from the neighboring cells. So, as you can see, here the channel is characterized by this matrix H, all right? The problem is that we have to recover the signals that have been transmitted here, so which are embedded in the vector X, and of course, if we don't know X, we don't know X, and if we don't know H, then we are in trouble. So what... No, 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 it can, it's a rectangular matrix in general, yeah. So the, the idea is that, of course, we have to know in some sense uh, the H matrix. So what we do in this kind of network is that we transmit what we call uh, pilot sequences, which is in fact a sequence of known symbols and uh, onto which we will project the coefficients of this channel matrix so that we can estimate these coefficients. All right, and at the end, so our new problem is that we have just to detect what has been transmitted in X when we know, in some sense, or when we have estimated the channel coefficients which are embedded in this matrix H. Okay, so this is what happens in the multi-user case. So you see, uh, you have exactly the same kind of, uh, of expression but then we have uh, the, the, the sum of the two components coming from the two uh, uh, terminals. So, now for 5G, 5G in fact is using what is called massive MIMO, which means that the, the base station, we have a lot of antennas, many, many antennas. It can be 64, 128, okay? And uh, what is called CSI, so it is a channel state information, so it is the knowledge of the channel or the knowledge of the H matrices, lives in this case in a high dimensional vector space because of massive MIMO. So the problem is that in order to estimate all these coefficients, we need to send a lot of pilots. All right? And at the end, the problem is that if we send pilots, then we have less space for sending data. And uh, that's why one possibility could be this. Because in fact, the CSI lives in a very high dimensional vector space. In fact, what is sure is that for a given cell, let's say that the, the set of all possible CSI uh, doesn't fill the whole space, but rather lives in a manifold which will be of dimension, which can be, if, if we have many, many antennas, it can be much less than the whole space, the whole original space, all right? And so, the idea should be here to go from this high dimensional vector that requires a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, pilots, and uh, so, which will, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, prevent the, the transmission of high rate data, in instead of using the whole space, just try to use this uh, uh, manifold of lower dimension, all right? In this case, it will reduce signaling and also reduce the feedback. So the feedback can be necessary, for example, if you want to transmit then, for example, in downlink from the base station to the terminals, the base station has to know the channel which goes from the base station to the terminals and which is accessible only 
at the terminus, for example, I mean in some cases, let's say, uh, let be uh, not uh, too general. And uh, in this case, learning this manifold, knowing what could be this manifold, could be very valuable for us. Okay? Then another uh, problem, I mean another application related to the channel, is uh, fingerprinting. So there are some people uh, in our lab who have implemented uh, some fingerprinting approach in order to uh, uh, in order to have the localization of the terminals by using machine learning. The idea is to use uh, the CSI, so the channel knowledge at the base station, in order to determine the localization of the terminal. Okay. So, the, what is the idea? The idea is that, in fact, uh, by using uh, uh, supervised machine learning, we train uh, a neural network. It can be extreme learning, deep learning, I mean, um, there are many possibilities, in order to learn a given, uh, let's say, a function, phi, which defines a manifold here as well. And uh, this uh, function, in fact, is a function of the CSI and of the position of the terminal. Okay? So we train a neural network in order to learn this function, or at least partly, and then uh, once this uh, uh, stage uh, is finished, we can find the localization as a function of the CSI. All right? The problem is that in this case, as well as in the other case, what happens is that uh, the, the manifold we have to, to learn, uh, in general, is uh, learned with noise, uh, it can be noisy observation. We can have uh, small variations of the channel because the problem is that uh, the channel behavior depends also on the obstacles that uh, you can find uh, on the path of the, 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 the waves. And uh, these uh, obstacles may be fixed or moving like uh, cars or, or human beings. I mean, uh, yeah. So this is another uh, 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 another, let's say, example where we need uh, to learn some manifold which can be impaired by noise, by some uh, cluttering, by, uh, you know, some uh, uh, small changes of, uh, of the channel. All right? So, and for, for these uh, two cases, uh, they, in fact, we can propose uh, to use persistent homology to uh, uh, solve at least partly these uh, problems. Okay? Another problem, so <laughs> what is uh, quite uh, amazing is that uh, this morning I have discussed uh, with uh, Daniel about uh, these uh, belief propagation on graphs and uh, I didn't know that uh, there were some uh, solutions, uh, I mean, uh, based on, uh, on, on the computation of cohomologies and uh, so that's uh, good news for us. Okay, especially we have this problem of uh, uh, making belief propagation work on graphs, essentially in channel coding. Okay, so for example, in 5G, so in the fifth generation that uh, we are developing right now, of uh, wireless uh, networks, wireless cellular networks, in fact, uh, the channel codes that have been uh, uh, adopted for 5G, uh, I mean, for what has been done right now, but maybe uh, there will not be so much changes in, in the next releases. They are what are called LDPC codes for in order to encode data bits, and polar codes in order to encode control uh, bits, control channels. So data is the information that uh, is sent, and uh, the control is the bits that are useful in order to make the network work. Okay? So, and uh, these two families of codes are quite different. LDPC codes, in fact, are decodable by using a belief propagation over a graph, which is called uh, a tanograph. And polar codes are decodable using another kind of algorithm, which is called serial cancellation. And apparently, it's not related to uh, belief propagation. Not not yet, let's say. 
So what we know about the decoding of LDPC codes is that the tunnel graph of LDPC codes on which we have to run belief propagation is loopy. We have cycles. And so in this case, we know that belief propagation doesn't work. I mean, we cannot make it work well, or it's uh, something that is uh, very painful, uh, very complex, and, and so on. OK? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so, sure. Uh, sorry for that. So you have a graph, yes? And uh, uh, you, the idea is that you have uh, some uh, probabilities on uh, uh, on uh, vertices of uh, this graph, right? And uh, the idea is that, uh, um, for example, you have some constraints. Uh, some vertices can correspond to some constraints, okay? That, in fact, will change the, the probability. You start with unconstrained probabilities, and then you take into account these constraints, right? By uh, And uh, you have... Uh, uh, the idea is to uh, to do what is called also message passing on the graph, on the edges of the graph, so that you take into account locally uh, uh, the, the all these constraints, right? And at the end, the idea is to have a global understanding. That means, uh, at the end, the op let's say the, the, the optimal thing that you have to do is uh, to, um, uh, to uh, let's say, uh, to take into account, let's say, uh, all these constraints, right? And uh, if you have a tree, then it's quite easy to do it, right? But if you have cycles, then uh, uh, we, 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 we get uh, some issues. And uh, it's, uh, it's very hard uh, to, to have the optimal solution in this case, right? So, and... Uh, uh, but for LDPC codes, in fact, uh, the method we use uh, to decode them is uh, to use uh, belief propagation as if it were a tree. Because what we know is that when the length of the LDPC codes goes to infinity, then the tunnel graph tends to be a tree. But, of course, we are not using infinite length codes. And uh, the idea is that we use belief propagation as if it were a tree. But, so it's suboptimal, but we design the code in such a way that the gap to optimality is uh, kept small. All right? Okay. So, in this case, let's say that we don't really need uh, 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 the, uh, to, to, to run uh, belief propagations on a loopy graph. But there is another case, which is polar codes. So, very quickly, so polar codes is based on uh, what is called the kernel. So suppose that you have, uh, so the simplest kernel, which is the original one, is called the Arikan's kernel. Uh, so Arikan is the inventor of uh, polar codes. And uh, in fact, it works in this way. U1 and U2 are two bits, all right? And then uh, X2 equals U2 x1 equals u1 plus u2, okay? Then x1 and x2 are sent into the uh, a given channel that can introduce <laughs> errors, uh, erasures, or can add uh, uh, Gaussian noise, for example. And so, in fact, x1 and x2 will see exactly the same channel, right? And the output of the channel will be y1 and y2. But then, the idea is that, in this case, what u1 and u2, which are the information bits, what these bits will see, I mean, which channels will they see? Because of course, x1 and x2 will see the same channel, but u1 and u2 will not see the same channel. And so here is how it works. So, okay, this is matrix form. And let's do a capacity analysis of uh, what happens here. Okay. Suppose that I of x and y is uh, the mutual information between x and y. So it can be an index because it's exactly the same channel we have here. So if we consider the, this uh, vector channel now, we have uh, the, uh, the, the mutual information is the sum because uh, it's, uh, these two channels are independent. And so this is I of x1, x2 and the vector y, 
which is uh, y1, y2, okay? Then I replace, in fact, this, in fact, uh, what I want to, to know is what happens if you, uh, instead of having x and x1, x2, you have u1, u2. So, in fact, because u1 is x1 plus, uh, sorry, because in this case, you can recover u1 by doing the addition of x1 and x2. And then once you have recovered u1, you can say that u2 is just, can be recovered by the observation y and the knowledge of u1, then you get this kind of equality, right? And what, and in fact, what happens is that this first term is smaller than the, 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 the symmetric mutual information, right? Which is the capacity in this case if we consider symmetric channels. And this will be larger, okay? And uh, now polar codes are formed by considering the uh, n time, n time, sorry, the, the Kronecker power of this kernel, of the Arikan kernel, okay? And in this case, what happens is that for a given ratio of the bits that we have, the first term will tend to zero, and for the rest, it will tend to one. And the ratio of bits for which the mutual information here tends to one uh, will exactly be the capacity of the channel if n goes to infinity. All right? So, and this phenomenon is called the polarization, the channel polarization. And uh, this is why these codes are called polar codes. All right? But then the problem is that the Sarikan kernel is polarizing, but too slowly. So, the, uh, too slowly with respect to the length of the polar code. So, the idea is that we want to find some better polarizing kernels. Of course, their size will be bigger than uh, uh, 2, which is the case for the Arikan uh, kernel. It will be of size L for given L. The problem is that if we have a general kernel, so a general kernel will be, let's say, a square matrix of size L and which is invertible in uh, the, the, um, the finite field of size 2. Okay? And, uh, okay, let's uh, forget it. So, this, and uh, what we know is that kernels with better scaling exponent exist if the length is uh, more than 8 and uh, there is another exponent which is the error exponent and these two exponents, in fact, characterize the way the channel polarizes with respect to the length of the code. And uh, for example, there are kernels, okay, for example, this kernel of length 16 is known to be the best kernel in length 16 in terms of uh, error exponent. Okay? So, now, what we have to do is that if we want to find the equations of decoding of a big kernel, then in fact for each bit that is decoded, it corresponds to a tenograph, and this tenograph may have cycles. This is for example for length 8, and for decoding the third bit, this is the corresponding graph. As you can see, there are cycles. And this is a very simple one. If you have, for example, the kernel that I showed you the EBCH uh, kernel of length 16, for decoding, uh, for example, bits in the middle, then the tenograph will be uh, really, uh, um, uh, very, will be terrible. The, 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 it's uh, something that is very, very hard to decode. Okay? So, and how to decode it is by running belief propagation on this kind of graph, on the tenograph. Okay, and we cannot do the same as for LDPC codes. We cannot change the code because this is not a code. This is the kernel that is fixed. And uh, so we have to find a way. And uh, uh, what I was uh, thinking even before uh, uh, talking with uh, Daniel was that belief propagation is exactly this, local to global. So there the should be some cohomology and uh, so. And I was happy to learn that it's true. So. I will be uh, happy to, to read uh, what you have done on this topic. All right. 
Now, okay, now we have identified uh, some, a couple of problems. Uh, I have also identified some uh, uh, publication uh, which apply shifts on the domains, on the areas that I have listed at the beginning of my talk, right? And uh, I can show you some, a, a couple of examples. First one, uh, sorry, before starting, uh, we, we have, in fact, as I told you, to use uh, um, topological spaces on which we can compute things like cohomology groups. And uh, in this case, uh, one good choice is to use simplicial complexes as topological space. So for, for those uh, who don't know what it is, so what is a case simplex? Uh, let's say, so th this is the concrete uh, point of view of, uh, of uh, simplicial complex. And uh, so this is, uh, for example, the zero simplex is vertex, one simplex is an edge, a triangle for two simplex, tetrahedron for three simplex, etc. Okay? And uh, a simplicial complex uh, is a finite set of simplices that has sat satisfied these two uh, properties. Okay? So, okay, now in order to apply uh, these, uh, these uh, <coughs> to apply this, uh, the, 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 for example, to be able to compute the cohomology uh, on these uh, simplicial complexes in a way that will be efficient for our applications. In fact, uh, this is a very restricted way of defining uh, uh, a pre sheaf on this uh, on this uh, complex, but it is the one which will be useful for us. Okay. So, in fact, uh, we 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 define our pre sheaf on the category of vector spaces or it can be modules and, uh, and uh, so the we define uh, of course a restriction which we will call this way f of a and a rho b and a b are two faces and uh, uh, of course uh, we have a consistency of the composition and we have also to define uh, a morphism between uh, pre sheaves or sheaves and uh, so this is, uh, uh, it assigns uh, for each face a linear map uh, which uh, satisfy this equality, okay? And then we define a quantity uh, which is so B A and uh, this uh, quantity equals zero if A is not a face of B. Otherwise it equals plus or minus one depending on the orientation and uh, this uh, quantity will be useful to compute uh, with what follows uh, and essentially the co-boundaries, uh, etc. So, this is our co-boundary which is defined this way and um, so this is uh, the, the, the formal sum over all K simplex uh, and uh, you see this appears, so this is the restriction map and uh, uh, sigma of a, um, sorry, okay, let me go on. So uh, this, uh, we have the, the classical, uh, uh, we have the classical uh, relations between the, the, the kernel of uh, uh, decay and uh, the, uh, the, so the cycles and the co-boundaries. And because of that, of course, uh, we have, a, uh, we have a BK, which is a, a subgroup of ZK. And uh, in this case, uh, the cohomology group, uh, the case cohomology group, uh, will be defined in this way as the quotient group. Okay, and in this case, uh, we get a sequence of uh, linear maps. Uh, from uh, and uh, and of course uh, this uh, in fact uh, the idea is that only the elements of in fact the idea of this uh, cohomology group is that only the elements of zk that are not already consistent are worth mentioning. Okay, and now let's apply it to sampling theory. So. 
this example comes from this uh, reference from Rob Michael Robinson, and he proposes a shift interpretation of the sampling theorem. Okay? So, in fact, he starts with a shift of vector spaces on an abstract simplicial complex. Okay? And then he uses sh shift morphism between two shifts. So F, which is a shift on, uh, on this uh, simplicial complex, and S is in fact what is called a sampling uh, sheath and uh, which correspond uh, to the, 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 the operation of, uh, of sampling and it is associated to, the, to a sampling morphism from F to S and uh, then it defines an ambiguity sheath A in which simply the, uh, uh, the stalk, in fact A of small a, where small a is a face is just the kernel of uh, this map, all right? And uh, this is uh, the shift theoretic sampling theorem that it derives. It is that the global sections of F, so of, uh, uh, are identical with the global section of S, which means that we can reconstruct, in fact, we can reconstruct uh, the, um, uh, we can, uh, we can reconstruct the, this just uh, from uh, this, uh, if and only if, uh, in fact, the case homology, homology group, cohomology group uh, related to the ambiguity sheath is uh, zero for k equals zero and k equals one. So, and from there, it can uh, uh, recover the classical uh, Shannon Hartley sampling theorem of. Uh, 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 of band-limited uh, functions, for example, or some other results uh, coming from graph theory or, or from a quantum graph, if I remember well. Okay, so in fact, we can have in signal processing, we by using sheaves, we can generalize the results that uh, uh, we had uh, at the origin. Second example: network coding, and. Uh, it has been developed in this uh, paper from uh, Grist and Iraoka. And uh, in fact, so very quickly, uh, they, have, uh, they have built uh, shift cohomologies, in which case H0 is equivalent to the information flows that we have in the network. And uh, in the many practical problems may be solved by using uh, these uh, cohomologies, such as uh, the max flow bounds, network robustness, and some other ones. Right? And the final example, persistent homology, which uh, I think will be very valuable in our case if we want to learn the channel to denoise uh, what we measure, so to denoise it, uh, to remove the small variations in order to keep only what is persistent. And so it's uh, still uh, simplices, complex. Okay, so in this case, now, we define an, an elementary key chain uh, in this way. And of course, we have two different orientations, uh, and, uh, which are here represented by the sign plus or minus. And uh, this is a key chain. So in the case of persistent homology, what is used is essentially uh, coefficients in Z, but it can be uh, an abelian group. And uh, yeah. And then, so we, we have uh, these, uh, we define these, uh, the boundary operator in this way. So, so now, of course, uh, we are in the reverse direction compared to cohomology. So we go from k to k minus 1. And uh, the same way as for cohomology, so we have uh, the kth homology group now, which is uh, the, the quotient group of uh, the, the kernel, so the, the, the cycles by the boundaries. And we have also uh, Betty numbers, which are useful in persistent homology, which are defined as being the rank of uh, these uh, homology groups. Okay, so now, uh, coming from there, uh, what is persistent homology? So, suppose we have a cloud of points in a space, all right? And uh, in our case, it will be the measurements that we will do. And from there, we need to find structures. We need to remove noise, we need to remove the small variations, the clutters, etc. And we need to find some structure inside this cloud of points. Okay? So, how to do it? So, what would be uh, theoretically uh, the most acceptable 
would be to build a church complex uh, in this way. So you draw some balls around uh, of given um, uh, radius around uh, the, the, the points and uh, then you form a simplex S if there is at least one common point in each ball of S. All right? The problem is that computationally it's very hard. I mean, it's something for which it will be hard to compute uh, the homology groups. So instead of this, what we do in practice is rather to consider the RIPS complexes. And in this case, we will form a simplex if there is at least one common point in the balls which are considered now pairwise. Okay? So for example, this one is a two simplex for the RIPS topology, but not for the church one. Okay? So, and then we considered uh, a nested sequence of topological spaces, uh, x0, x0, x1, etc. And this is done just by considering, vari in our case, varying uh, radiuses, radii from uh, the smallest one to the biggest one. And in this case, we need for, uh, sorry, we obtain for each of them uh, uh, homology groups. Okay, and then in fact what happens is that we want to identify when a homology class is born and when it dies, all right? And uh, so in this case, for example, this one is born here and dies here, okay? And the birth and death of the homology classes will be very important because with this, we can construct uh, barcodes and uh, sorry barcodes and in this case long bars will have a long life and it will mean that long bars will be the persistent features all right so for example if we use the rips complex so this is uh, so the, our cloud of points you see they are more or less in a, in a torus, I mean on the torus, uh, or a donut, and uh, when, so this is uh, the complexes we obtain when the radius increases, okay? And for the same thing, these are the barcodes. So these are the, so on the uh, x-axis you have, uh, it's parameterized by epsilon. So this is uh, the homology uh, groups H0, H1, and H2, uh, as you can see, this one is persistent, this one is persistent, yeah, and uh, so. How long does it have to be? Sorry? How long does it have to be? Uh, this, uh, I don't know exactly, <laughs> excellent question, but uh, uh, it depends probably on the application that, yeah, uh, because uh, it depends mainly on the application, yeah. Okay. And uh, I found uh, something related to the topos of persistence. And uh, that means that, in fact, it's a kind of generalization of uh, the topos of sets, in which instead uh, of having just uh, sets, we have uh, sets indexed by time. Yeah? So uh, th these are given by the these uh, barcodes that uh, I have shown to you and uh, it corresponds to time index sets and with the on these uh, time index sets in fact we can construct a persistence heighting algebra of intervals ordered by inclusions and uh, the sheaves of uh, this algebra p encode barcodes all right and uh, sorry this is a very simple example for example here so at time zero uh, so these uh, zero correspond to the time and this one uh, to the dimension of the homology. Yeah. So here, for example, in this case, as you can see, uh, uh, H0 of zero is uh, essentially, I mean, uh, XY quotient by zero. So it is uh, as morphic to Z plus Z. And the H1 of zero is uh, just zero because uh, you have only two vertices, so two points. Then at time one, we have this. And we can compute H0 of 1, which is this, and in fact, it's isomorphic to Z. And H1 of 1 can be computed, and we can see that it is isomorphic to Z as well, etc. 
we can compute the homology group of all these guys. And uh, so, by doing uh, gluing, in fact, we, can glue, we may glue the pointwise homology groups together consistently and uh, uh, in order to extract global information. So it's, uh, of course, it's a toy example. And the global information is this one for t. In, in, in the interval 0, 1, we have a 0 equals to this, changing to a 0 equals to z when t goes from 1 to 5. And for the first uh, uh, homology group, we have for, t for t equals 1 to 2, we have h1 equals z, changing to h1 equals 0 when t is, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the union of these two intervals. And uh, so th th this is a very simple example of uh, one uh, uh, topos, uh, so which is uh, related to persistent homology and which may, may be uh, useful uh, for us. And uh, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. So are there some questions? I mean, for this last example, so yes. does this suggest new algorithms? Or, uh, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. It's not yet. In fact, there are algorithms for computing, of course. They, yeah, uh, maybe they have to be simplified because, in general, it's very heavy. And uh, but uh, the uh, the idea now, for example, uh, okay, there are some ideas now of combining uh, uh, persistent homology. I mean, in fact, the topological analysis of data with the neural networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, for now, I have just seen uh, one paper which is not very. Uh, I mean, it's not uh, very. Uh, very easy to understand what they are doing, so and that's it. But this will be next step, because uh, apparently uh, using uh, uh, topological data analysis plus uh, machine learning uh, uh, seems to be uh, very efficient. Other questions? Maybe one, one, or no? Yes, I have to ask, the, do this method uh, give an hint on uh, what you told before that uh, this uh, small uh, dimensional? Uh, yeah, yes, the idea is, yes, the idea is to try to characterize these manifolds, in fact, uh, thanks to the uh, homology group. Yeah. Usually it's not really exactly the homology group you can put yeah. have a name of spectral sequence. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is not really cycle at each. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Let me one comment. I mean, it was very interesting the, the fact that uh, I mean, some people revisit the sampling theorem mm. of Shannon based oh, on topos. Yeah. My question is that did you see some, some results on compressed sensing and topos, which could be also uh, linked to the fact that maybe you want to, from a, a couple of samples, try to find a global representation of your information? No, I haven't seen right now. But I haven't searched really uh, into that direction. So, yeah. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll take a 15 minutes break, and then we'll have a, a short discussion, like half an hour. Uh, so come back at 4, and we'll do from 4 to 4.30. And Thanks.